Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Macy May, and I'm uh, the editor of the Walmart Leader. And today I'm here with uh, Dr. Don Haddad, with, who is the sup superintendent of the St. Green Valley School District. And uh, he is here today to talk to us about some of our questions around school reopening. So thank you very much, Don, for uh, joining us here today and answering all of our questions. Sure. Thanks for having me here. I appreciate it. Absolutely. So we're just going to start this off. I know lots of people have a ton of questions and we're going to get through as many of those as we possibly can. But if you wouldn't mind, could you re, um, reiterate kind of what the plan is for the school year and how, what that kind of looks like for our parents? Of course. One thing I would always preface it by saying is, you know, given the uncertainty of how the coronavirus will continue to evolve, we always want people to know that this is our plan as of today. It feels comfortable in terms of moving forward, but we always know that it's subject to change depending on what Boulder County Department of Health and the Colorado Department of Public Health tells us and things like that. So we are looking at a hybrid model, eight through 12. We also have preschool in session and we'll be following at preschool level all the guidelines from the state. So we'll be running a relatively normal operation with our preschool students. K through 12 will be a hybrid model. And what that'll look like at the elementary school and the middle school and at the high school level, you'll have kids separated into two groups, A and B. So group one, group two, or group A, group B. And at the high school level, group A would come in for two days on Monday and Tuesday. Then they would be at home Wednesday and Thursday while group two comes in on Wednesday and Thursday. And then on Friday, it would be a different group each Friday. So the first Friday would be group one, second Friday would be group two. So at the high school level, they would alternate between having two days or three days in person in the school and the other days would be at home. And the middle school would be on the same kind of schedule, just rotating the same schedule that they're currently on rotating one day it would be group A and then group B and then group A and then group B and so on and so forth. And then elementary school, it would be the same thing. So the end result would be that we would have half the students in the school each day and it would be a different half every day. The other thing that will reduce class size is even more than just the half hybrid model is that we have our launched ed online program, which is open to any student K through 12 We'll actually have that across the board and there's no criteria other than that's what you choose as a parent and student. And so the numbers would be cut in half in terms of student enrollment in the school on any given day, but then they would also be lowered by the students who have selected the online full time. And right now we're, you know, about getting close to 1200 students throughout the district who have selected that. My hunch is it will continue to rise and that will bring our class sizes down even more. And why we uh, chose this, one, we have technology that allows our students when they are at home to log in virtually in real time because every teacher will have a laptop, they'll have high powered lenses and wide lenses and then microphones. So as a student, if I'm at home, I can log in for the first part of the class or I can log in virtually in real time for the entire class, whichever I choose. And uh, that's a little bit unique to St. Rain. A lot of other school districts don't have that capacity. So they're either online on their own or they're in person. With ours, we can be in person or online at home, but coming in virtually in real time. The other thing that it does for us is it lowers our class sizes so that we can adhere to the guidelines from Boulder County Health and the Colorado Department of Public Health, meaning we can separate kids by a number of feet, which is good. And the, the goal is six feet and by lowering those. Now they tell us that three feet is adequate. When I say they, I mean the Department of Health, but we can do more by going to this hybrid model. We will also have students that are required to wear masks throughout the day and teachers and staff as well. But this hybrid model allows us to kind of slow, slowly get back into the system and have the buildings at half capacity 
in terms of the numbers of students in the building. That also takes pressure off of our ventilation systems. Our ventilation systems are set to operate well beyond the standard of safety by ASHRAE, which is the American Society of Heating and uh, Refrigerator Engineers and things along those lines. So we are at a much higher level of productivity. And then with the student body lowered, that functions at an even higher level. So we feel very good about that. And then it gives our students and our parents and our teachers a chance to settle in in a nice, calm environment to start with. Um, so those are all the things that caused us to go with the hybrid. We were told by uh, Boulder County Health that we needed to do X, Y, and Z in terms of mitigation. And this allows us the in-person experience to keep our students connected to their teachers and their staff which is really important, keeping them closely connected to school, but also keeping the class sizes down to adhere to the guidelines and the expectations that are being asked of us from the Department of Health. Great. You mentioned some of that synchronized learning from home. How much time are students expected to uh, log into their, their classroom from home? You know, we'd like for them to at least log in to the first 15 minutes, 20 minutes, and the teachers will direct that and coach their students as to how much they should log in. But typically, you know, if they're logging in at the beginning and getting the instructions and the directions, and then they can engage in independent study. Now, some students are going to want to log in for the entire time because they'll feel more comfortable staying connected and watching and listening and learning and those kinds of things. But it won't necessarily be necessary because we don't expect kids to be logged in online on screen for an entire day. Um, it'll just be strategic based on the direction of the teacher to, in terms of how long they, and we hope that that will be at the beginning so that there'll be some latitude for the student. But, uh, but yeah, we don't anticipate that they should be logged in the entire time by any stretch. Great. And um, in the situation where um, we have to return to online learning, um, what, what is the district's plan for that and how easy would that transition be? Well, we currently now have a device, an iPad for every single one of our students all the way through the system. And our teachers are all equipped with laptops and the microphones and the lenses. And so we can transition, if we had to, everyone to at-home learning, and we could do a combination of synchronous learning and online learning. And so it would be a blended model, where some of the time they're synchronously logged in with their teacher, like we are now, and other times they would be working independently off of uh, assignments that are posted to the various platforms that we have um, available to them. But the transition would be relatively, you know, nothing's smooth when you're talking about the COVID virus, nothing's completely smooth, but it would be relatively smooth for us given the fact that we have the equipment, the technology, the teachers and the students, and in this hybrid model, they'll become acclimated to how to work at home. We also have the benefit, for lack of a better word, of the fact that they went through the spring semester so many of our students and teachers this is a little different because we didn't necessarily do the synchronous learning during the springtime but we will be making that part of our uh, system for the fall perfect um some some folks are chatting in right now and they're curious about uh deadlines for enrolling in the online school and the uh was it launch ed and are there any are there any deadlines into the school year such that if I send my student there and two weeks in I decide this is not the, the model that works for them and I choose online, can they change to the online schooling at that point? Yeah, we, uh, we'd like, we've set a tentative deadline for August 12th. I think that's a Wednesday. I'm not sure, but I think that's a Wednesday, but August 12th, which will give us enough time to create all of the classrooms and teacher assignments and things like that. And to your point, if I start online and two weeks later, if I select, let's say, launch dev, and then two weeks later, I decide I want to return to in-person, we will allow that. 
we would just ask that uh, the parents would work with the principal at that point in time uh, to transition at a time that makes sense, usually at a quarter break or a semester break, but we're not going to be really rigid with that. If there's a real pressing need to start right away, we will allow flexibility with families. Um, that's been one of our, uh, you know, our guiding principles that we want to be flexible. So yes, if you start online, you can transition back to in-person. If you start in person, you can transition out to online if you feel like that's something that you would like to do. Great. Uh, can you talk about some of the expectations um, with parents? I know there was talk about parents needing to check temperatures, but basically could you walk us through how, to, our, how parents should prepare their students every day for school in this system? Yeah, we're asking parents uh, at the elementary school level to make sure that they have two masks for their children, one that we can keep in a baggie with their name on it at school in the event that they forget, and then one that they take home with them every night and make sure it's a mask that fits well and that your child is able to take them off and put them on on their own and they feel comfortable with that. We also are asking that parents take their child's temperature before they leave the house every day. And if it's uh, at 100.4 or higher, then we would ask them to stay home. And that's per direction from the Department of Health. We would also ask them if they can to have uh, coach them on washing their hands regularly throughout the day when they take breaks and coach them around hand sanitizers. If they, you know, sometimes, uh, depending on the comfort level of the parent, to have a little bottle with their child in their, uh, you know, that they send with them and they could use that. And again, that's a little different for younger students versus older students, things like that. We'll let the parents be the, the guide for that. And then we have, a, you know, a Safe with Seven campaign that talks about washing your hands, making sure you have your mask, making sure you're practicing social distancing. So parents, we'd like you to coach your students, especially our younger ones, not to get, you know, sometimes elementary school kids, they'll get, you know, touch each other and grab each other and all those kinds of things, you know, in a, in a normally appropriate way. But in this environment, we're asking them to, uh, you know, to kind of try to maintain that social distance as much as they can. Um, one thing that we're really told multiple times is that the likelihood of transmission with kids that age is very, very, very low. And if it were to happen, the symptoms are much less severe almost always um, than influenza, the regular influenza for elementary school kids, which is what we're talking about right now. But those are the kinds of things that we would want um, you know, our parents help with that, that taking their temperature is going to be the big one at home and just feeling comfortable keeping them at home in, if they're running any kind of a temperature at all at 100.4 or above. Some parents have been asking, why aren't the schools uh, taking temperatures? Yeah, we've been encouraged by the Department of Health, their lead doctors from both Colorado and Boulder County to have that done at home so that students don't get to school with a temperature because once they get to school with the temperature then you have to put them in a room and then call the parents and have the parents come pick them up and sometimes parents can't do that and so it just triggers a whole set of responses that are really unnecessary and what we're encouraging we have in the handouts we gave a checklist that parents can print out and on that checklist it tells them everything that they should be doing with their student before they send them to school. And so we would encourage parents to post that in a place that's visible in their home. Uh, you know, maybe it's on the refrigerator, maybe it's on the door that before they walk out and just make sure that that's done, that all of those things are, all those boxes are checked. Um, and this is one of those situations where, uh, you know, parents are, are a key element of this partnership and for every parent, it, you know, we know there is nothing more important than their child in, in, the, in the world. I mean, that's the most important thing to any parent. We know that. And so we believe that they will enthusiastically embrace that opportunity to take their child's temperature and make sure that they are safe to go to school. And that's something that we appreciate very much that parents will do. If a student were to get to school and demonstrate overt 
symptoms, they're coughing, they're sneezing, they look lethargic, we would then take their temperature. But again, it is so critically important that that happens before they leave home. And if they have that temperature or any of the other, that they stay home. What happens in a situation where um, potentially a, a child, staff member, a teacher, somebody tests positive for COVID or even in an outbreak situation? What are the district's plans for that? We have an epidemiologist assigned to our school district from Boulder County Public Health. And we also have several contact tracers. And so if there were to be someone who tested positive, we also have a system that will be in place where our teachers have access to testing at no charge to the teacher. And if anyone were to test positive, we would ask them at that point to stay home. We would turn that information over to the epidemiologist. They would run their typical protocol and then they would tell us what would happen because in each situation, it might be different depending on who that person has come into contact with and a whole host of other things. But it would always start with stay home, report it to the epidemiologist, which we would do, the contact tracing, and then direction from there as to if any other things need to happen. Does a group of students need to be quarantined? Does a classroom need to be quarantined? Does a school need to be quarantined? Or more than one school? And in that instance, we would shift to online learning for anyone who falls into that category. So will parents be notified if someone inside their classroom or someone their student was in contact with tested positive? Yeah, and that's where the contact tracing comes in. And that's where Boulder County and the health departments, similar to what would happen even if we're not in school. You know, right now in the summer, if somebody were to test positive, they would contact Trace and they would go back and tell people, but the, the county department, the county health department would be responsible for delivering that information uh, to the families and then also to answer whatever questions that they might have. So. How can parents make sure that they um, are set up to, to receive those notifications? Well, they would receive, they would be contacted by Boulder County Health and Boulder County Health would share with us you know, what their steps are. And we would make sure that, uh, you know, there are a series of different ways that we can communicate with our parents, regardless of what the information is for their child. But that contact would be made uh, by Boulder County Health because it, you know, it's a, it's a health, it's a health matter. And, you know, there are other things uh, that we deal with, you know, whether it's pertussis. I remember a time when we had a tuberculosis outbreak and there are other things that happen if a certain number of children in a school contact regular influence or any of these other things. They have these protocols in place. And that's where we, when I get asked that question, I never want to get out in front of it because the, it may be a, a different response depending on the circumstances. And, uh, and the health Department of Health would guide that. But it would always start with staying home, notifying the epidemiologist in Boulder County Health, and then they would take it from there with the contact tracing and the notifications. Great. So um, I think I'm gonna switch on over. A lot of uh, parents were concerned that after the last school board meeting, there was not a plan, at least announced at that time, uh, about special education. Is there a plan for special education students that, um, now? Yeah, you know, our special education students, children with special needs, they have individual education plans, individualized education plans. They refer to them as IEPs. And the coordinators, we have several coordinators in our special education department, and it's led by Laura Hess, who's our executive director. And they, along with our teachers, will be working with each student individually based on their particular IEP. And so the plan is that every student will get individualized attention from their coordinator, from their teacher, and their family would, articulating exactly what the plan is for their child. Because with each special needs child, the plan might look different. Some will need to come in every day. And if that's the need based on their IEP, then they would come in full time and receive those services in person full time. Some could do very well and it's not necessary and they might be on a hybrid model. 
And so whatever is in the best interest and in compliance with that child's individualized education plan, that's what we would do. And that's why we don't put out a blanket, here's what we do, because it's gonna look different for every one of our students. What I can guarantee and promise is that every one of our students will be afforded the resources and the support that they need based on their IEP and the contact and communication uh, from our special education department. It's good to know that we can just reach out as uh, special ed parents to whomever and uh, individualize our plans as we see fit. Uh, thank you th for that, personally. Thank you for that. Um, this one, you know, when you individualize the plans in accordance with the individualized, the IEP. Right. That's, yes, okay. Absolutely, thank you. I, I just, I love that I can talk to someone and figure Absolutely. out the plan with my, with my particular student. Um, so moving on to mask, you've briefly talked about how, how, how elementary school students are asked to bring in a separate um, mask and um, things like that. Do you have any sort of uh, restrictions or protocols on what kinds of masks are being worn? Some students can tolerate like a, a cloth mask or uh, a net gaiter, some maybe a face shield, or is there anything that the school district's outlined on that? Now we want it to be comfortable for the student. It can be a cloth mask. If they feel more comfortable in a face shield, they're certainly welcome to do that. If they have those gaiters that cover their mouth, and they can certainly do that. Uh, but we want it to be comfortable with us for the student, and we want them to be able to manage it and be able to put it on when it's appropriate, take it off. We also know that, especially with our younger children, they're gonna need a number of breaks. And so those will be built into the schedule every day where kids can go outside, you know, when they eat, obviously, they're not gonna have their masks on. And you know that the transmission level is so low at this age group in elementary school that uh, we have the opportunity to give lots of breaks. If there is a student, there's a child that has uh, any type of a pre-existing medical condition, we can create exemptions for that particular student and set it up to where um, they will be able to, to function without a mask in an area that is uh, still allows them to access a great uh, educational experience. Oh, great. Um, so how is the district handling specials and electives? I know some high school students have electives over at the Innovation Center. Um, yeah. How, how is that supposed to work? At the elementary school, we're working on cohorting specials. So specials will look a little bit different at the elementary school with art, music, and physical education to where cohorts stay and that way teachers aren't seeing all of the kids all of the time. And those plans will look just a little bit different at every elementary school based on facilities, and based on programming. And so the principals will explain a little bit of a nuance and difference at the elementary level. With the Innovation Center, students will be able to access the Innovation Center, and they will also be able to access the Career Development Center in person when appropriate and online when appropriate. But those two will be uh, available for students. And with traditional electives like band and orchestra and choir, there are certain guidelines that we have to adhere to and our principals and our music and other teachers arts will be receiving those guidelines and uh, they would be managed in the same way as a hybrid model where you would come in half the time in person and half the time at home and working virtually with those programs. And we saw some pretty incredible creative virtual choirs and other things that were created by our teachers. So all of the electives will be available, which is a good question because a number of districts have eliminated their elective programming so that they can limit kids to maybe th take three or four classes and that's it. Um, we didn't feel like that was necessary with our hybrid model because we can reduce class sizes enough and create the social distancing enough to where we didn't have to eliminate all of those other opportunities for students. Um, so for students who are doing the launch ed coursework and they are, have 
previously enrolled in things like orchestra, um, will they be able to participate in those courses? You know, every situation will look differently. They are, they are going to be able to participate. If they're enrolled in the online program uh, through Florida Virtual, if they have opportunities to enroll in some of the electives through that, then no, they would stay with uh, Florida Virtual. But there will be opportunities for some students, depending on whether or not the program is offered through Florida Virtual and whether or not the uh, the class sizes allow for that participation with uh, with a music program or drama or theater. Um, our hope is to be able to accommodate students in that way, but we have to wait and see what all of those class sizes look like and look at, take it on an individual basis with students. Uh, I'm just going to jump over here to a question. We have um, questions within this uh, platform. And one of the biggest questions I have here, or at least the one most voted on by uh, listeners today, is, and I'm just reading verbatim, I'm aware that many of the teachers in the district have been pulled, surveyed about the returning, uh, about returning to school full time. Have there been any surveys to parents, guardians about their desires to return? Yeah, what we've done is in all the letters that I've sent, we have included an invitation for parents to access the link that comes into our website and it's a questionnaire you can ask questions you can make suggestions you can and we have had hundreds and hundreds of parents express their opinion share their questions share their preference so we have heard from a number of them from that venue we also have on our website that uh, that question and answer kind of uh, you know, where they can contact our school board and myself through that venue. And then there are also been a number of people who have emailed me directly uh, to get information along those lines. So yes, we have had a lot of parents um, provide great feedback and I'm very appreciative of that. The thing about it is with this is you're really left with three options. You know, you're left with either you bring everybody back full time or you keep everybody home full time, or you go with a hybrid. And so what we wanted to do is provide choices for parents where you can either choose if, if you're among those that want to not come in at all, you have that online option. If you're among those who want to come in, you have the option for the hybrid model. And if you have special needs and circumstances, there will be full-time opportunities for, for some. One of the things that makes you know, makes it a little bit easier for us is the synchronous learning capacity that we have. We have also set up uh, in each of our elementary schools, a community schools daycare program, so that if you do find yourself in a challenging situation with daycare, um, we've tried to accommodate that as well. So when I say that to you, there has not been really much of any feedback from parents except one of those three options. They'll say, I want the hybrid, I want full in, or I want full out, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and we know that. We know that. And whether we've heard that from 10,000 people or whether we hear it from 12,000 people, we understand the three different options that are, people are looking for. Um, we have a, quite a few people after we have identified the hybrid, quite a few people are saying, you know, gosh, we'd like to be able to come in full time. And you know, we appreciate that and that's what we're all wanting to happen as soon as possible. But we also need to be able to implement the guidelines and the directions from our health county, our, our uh, county health departments, uh, in order to do that. And it's hard to social distance when you bring in 30 kids into a classroom. And so that's what caused us to move to that hybrid model. Another question from our, our listeners today, um, a recent survey was taken that indicated 78% of teachers were uncomfortable returning to the classroom. Uh, their exact question is, do we want our children being taught by people who feel unsafe being in the classroom? But how have you addressed the concerns of teachers in uh, reopening? Well, it's not 78% of the teachers in St. Rain. It's, uh, it's much lower than that. Uh, that was a survey done, I think, by the state 
association level. I have seen the survey from St. Brain Valley Schools teachers, and while there is, uh, you know, there's anxiety and there's question and there's concern, which is absolutely normal, and I appreciate that, and we've listened and we've tried to create as many accommodations and mitigation efforts as possible, but, uh, but that does not represent the majority of teachers in St. Brain. I hear from teachers in St. Brain all the time that they they are just really excited about getting back together with their students. And then the conversation switches to what measures are being taken to make sure that everyone is safe. Um, the other thing that I you know, would share with people, when you start to bring together all of the efforts in this comprehensive approach, and you think about temperature checks at home, you think about masks, you think about social distancing, you think about ventilation systems that are working at much higher levels of functioning than what's required. You think about the hand washing, you think about the sanitizing, you think about all of the precautionary measures that have taken place. Um, and it and the age of the students and the, the transmission things. Um, there's been a lot done to create even safer environments than exist normally. Um, and so I think that's that's kind of uh, the general sentiment. Um, I, I don't wanna say that there's not anxiety and there's not concern. The other thing is with our teachers, any teacher who has a pre-existing health condition, they would be teaching online as long as they qualify with that documented health related issue or a certain age group they would be able to teach online. And then we will move after that first tier of accommodations to teachers who have primary care responsibilities for somebody else at home and try to accommodate as many as possible there. So our teachers with, uh, with those concerns will be teaching online uh, for the most part. And that has helped alleviate some of the anxiety. I wanna be very respectful of the anxiety and the concern that you know, our teachers have, our parents have, or our students have, uh, because this is an unprecedented pandemic. And this is something that we're all concerned about. And we are leaning heavily on our health departments to tell us, you know, what's safe and what we needed to be doing to protect our students. In some instances, the schools might be the safest place to be when you consider all of the precautionary measures that we're taking. Uh, because what we know about students and, uh, and adults, even when they're not in school, it doesn't mean that they're not still going into the grocery stores and into the malls and, you know, into the restaurants or, uh, you know, out in the evenings, interacting with people in the parks and things like that. And oftentimes, you know, I see people interacting in those environments who aren't socially distanced and who up until a very short while ago weren't wearing masks and weren't checking their temperatures or we're going into buildings where the HVAC systems weren't as effective. Uh, so it's that whole unknown that I think uh, causes that anxiety. And we want to be respectful of that. And we're working very closely with our teachers association and all of our employees um, to mitigate those, those anxieties and those potential risks as much as we possibly can. We've hired a second custodial crew so we've doubled up on our custodial staff and we will be cleaning the buildings during the day with high touch areas and then we will be cleaning them again at night which is more than we normally do and so that's just another layer of mitigation so while we're on the topic of some of that support staff the custodians the um you know food service crews and things of that nature um, are, are there any requirements for them as far as um, temperature taking and, and things of that? And can you kind of talk about what the plan is around those uh, support staff? Yeah, we have the same expectations of our adults as we do of our students in terms of temperature checks, masks, social distancing, washing your hands, hand sanitizers. And we have a program set up for employees to be tested a couple of times a month at no cost to the employee um, around COVID and things along those lines. But yes, 
the expectations are for all of us, for me, for our teachers, for our principals, for our classified staff, our bus drivers, everyone. Substitute teachers as well. And uh, so everyone will be expected to adhere to the safety guidelines. So some parents were asking questions as well about substitute teachers. I mean, we are in a health pandemic. Um, we can ex probably expect at least a few teachers to get sick throughout the school year. Um, is, is there a specific plan for substitute teachers as they will be floating in and out of classrooms? Okay. Yeah, the testing, they will be uh, testing and then we'll also have uh, temperature taking when they come in, substitutes, we will actually ask them to take their temperature at home, but we will also take their temperature uh, before they enter. And then they will be expected to wear masks and all of the same safety precautions as everyone else. Mm -hmm. um, will those, those substitute teachers be monitored a little bit more as far as tracking uh, who they've been in contact with? Yeah, and that's part of the, the whole concept of we would take their temperature before they actually engage and we would ask them and have them test for COVID prior to starting as a substitute teacher and those kinds of things. So yeah, we would definitely be uh, doing everything we can to make sure that they're, you know, we're looking at not only how we respond if somebody, yeah, but we're trying to approach it from a preventative method, method or uh, standard first. But some folks were asking about um, attending like the IB program and that not being online. And um, are there other courses that maybe aren't offered online? And how will students um, continue with that work? They can choose the hybrid model. And then when they're at home, they can log in virtually in real time and be in that classroom experience just virtually. And they also would have the choice if they wanted full online because IB is not offered through Florida Virtual, they could synchronously come into that class every single day and follow their normal schedule from home in real time to be part of that, uh, that class. And IB is unique because Florida Virtual does not offer international baccalaureate and things along those lines. So yes, they can participate in that, in our AP programs and all of those kinds of programs, either from home or in person. Um, so what efforts are being made to align schedules for family with uh, students who span multiple grade levels, elementary to high school? Um, and are families allowed to weigh in on what those options might uh, might be? At the elementary and middle school level, we've asked principals, you know, obviously if you're in the same school, you would probably be separated by alphabet, so it would automatically happen. If you had two kids in an elementary school or two kids in a middle school or two kids in a high school or more. But if you happen to have one at the elementary and one at the middle level, and you fell in like one student was on an A day and one student was on a B day. We've asked the principals to get together and shift one of those students so that they're both on that same day so that they can come to school together and stay home together. At the high school level, it'll be a little bit different because that block schedule is such that they rotate a little bit different than elementary and middle. So at the elementary and middle level, we can definitely accommodate it at the high school level it's a little more challenging, but at the high school level, they go two days in a row. So they would, in some cases, be on the same. On one day, they would be on the same rotation as a sibling anyways. Because uh, if I'm coming in on Monday and Tuesday as a high school student in group one, mm -hmm. on one of those days where the, my elementary school sibling is rotating A day, B day, I might not be on the same day as them one of those days, but I would be on the second day. Um, so, but at the elementary and middle level, we can definitely align them fully. Are there ways to align like the Friday schedule for high school and elementary school? In some cases, but not, not in all cases. Elementary school kids, you know, they're just going to be on that every other day kind of rotation. Whereas high school kids, it would be every other Friday. So on right. some, case, some Fridays, they would connect and some Fridays, 
they they wouldn't necessarily connect. Um, so can we talk a little bit about um, busing and how students and families can, um, well, how will they see that? What would that look like? We sent home in the last communication information that indicates we have about 6,000 students who ride the bus out of our 33,000. And we sent home information on registering to ride the bus. And the reason we wanted them to register and submit that is so that we could get an idea of exactly how many kids are going to be on that bus. Now, one thing that'll happen with a hybrid model is because we're cutting the enrollment every day in half, that also cuts our bus ridership every day in half. And then when you throw in the launched ed for full-time online, it cuts the bus ridership down even more. But the key is parents have to register to let us know that they are going to ride the bus. Now, a number of districts have eliminated transportation except for, a number of our surrounding districts have eliminated transportation except for children with special needs. We chose not to eliminate transportation. We think we can accommodate everyone, uh, but we need parents to register so that we have a clear number and then we would do things like assigned seating on the bus, mask wearing on the bus, sitting six feet back from the bus driver, loading the bus from back to front, lowering windows when we need to, all of those kinds of things, taping off the bus seats so that there's a middle space that's open. Um, so kids are separated a little bit, uh, but that, that the first thing they absolutely have to do is register their student and that information was on my last communication that went home to all families under the transportation link. And uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure that most of that information is also up on the school website and we will post that in our chat for those of you who need that information one more time. Um, one other thing I would share with you is all of our principals and I have put together a video for each school and that will be coming out in August where parents can actually watch the principal walking through the school and talking them through, this is what your child's lunch period will look like. This is what it'll look like in the classroom. And so they'll be talking their way through it, but it'll also be a visual. So parents can actually see what a child's day will look like. And then the, the principal will remind them of the Safe with Seven campaign and all the things around temperature and everything else. So I would encourage parents to look for that uh, video when it comes out. They should also be looking for in the near future this week around uh, whether their child falls into group A or group B. And whichever one it is, then there is also a calendar of our school year month by month that has the A calendar and the B calendar. So once you see that letter from your principal and you find out is your child an A or a B group, then you would go to our calendar and look at the calendar for A days and a calendar for the B days and put that up in a place where you can access it uh, consistently. Speaking of calendars, I know in the past we've had late starts. Is late start still going to be something that's implemented in the district? Yes, we're going to still have late starts so that we can give our teachers a chance to come together. Now, all of our teacher meetings, they'll you know be able to come together and talk about, well, how did things go last this last few weeks and make adjustments as necessary. So we will have the late start days. Will those always be on the first Wednesday still? And then how do we offset that with our A group? Uh, yeah, and, and that, yeah, look, take a look at the calendars as they come out and it will articulate or you'll be able to see exactly when those are located or when those take place and it'll be all right there. Because what I don't want to do is, you know, say something that contradicts that, but just look at that visual and it'll tell you exactly. Um, but it won't, you'll still have an A day or a B day. So after the late start day, it'll still be either an A group or a B group that comes in. Okay. Um, so some parents were concerned about what kind of measures the district is taking to support their students um, in an emotional capacity. Has there been a plan implemented for this? Yeah, I mean, we have great counselors 
and we have great interventionists. And then obviously we have, uh, you know, teachers, outstanding teachers, and they will all be working together as we always do to support our children uh, emotionally and their, their well being. And that will be, uh, you know, a top priority for us. So as kids are struggling, which we know that some will, because this is a very, uh, this has been a very challenging experience. They'll have access to counselors. They'll have access to interventionists, to school psychologists, to social workers, to teachers, to administrators, to campus supervisors, to, I mean, you name it. We've got a lot of people that are 5,000% committed to these children, uh, all 33,000 of them. So uh, we're here to provide them with support. Right. Um, and we're also here to provide our teachers and our staff with that same, you know, with emotional support too, because it's it's not only a challenging time for children, it's a challenging time for adults, you know, and so we want to make sure that that we're responsive to all of all of the people within our system. What kind of supports are available for parents on those non contact days? You mean when they're at home? Yes when the students at home well the parents when you talk about support like are you talking about instructional support are you talking about food support what are you i'm, I'm talking um, about instructional support so being able to still work and um, know that my student is still engaged in their classroom yeah well they can either log in virtually in real time or they can work independently with their device at home or they can access any one of the 25, 26 community school daycare centers that we have open. And because uh, we'll have one in every one of our elementary schools. Uh, so those are the ways in which they'll have their academic support. And, uh, you know, for each age group, it's going to obviously be a lot easier for a high school student to engage academically if their parents not home. Uh, with parent with students who are really young who can't stay home by themselves they'll either have someone an extended family member that might be able to help them maybe it's an older sibling if you've got a high school and an elementary school kid at home at the same time maybe it's the community school's daycare program but we wanted to make sure there were at least options for parents that doesn't mean i'm not here to say it doesn't create a hardship for parents and I you know everything about me wants to mitigate every hardship that I can possibly mitigate I also understand that we are in the midst of an unprecedented pandemic and it's it's impossible to mitigate every person's hardship but we are committed to trying as best we can so you mentioned the community schools um, being offered in the elementary schools for daycare are those um, still just before and after school or are they spanning part of the school day yeah, both. Oh, okay. Yeah. Great. Um, and then what kind of, go ahead. That's why we have a site in each one of our schools, each one of our elementary schools. Perfect. Um, I'm, I skipped around in my questions a little bit, so I'm looking for where I was. Sorry about that. What about students who don't read yet or um, students who fall behind? Is there anything that special about those situations that the district plans to do? Yeah, we're setting up after school support tutoring for literacy in, uh, in our elementary schools. And then uh, we're also looking at creating uh, some small group opportunities on a Saturday, for example, or uh, after school. So there are definitely plans in place to try to avoid backsliding in terms of the capacity to read and, and things along those lines. So in essence, what we're doing is creating more time for kids. We also have you know, our virtual Myon reader for all of our elementary school students where parents can engage their students and read and it's translated into English and Spanish. And so parents can, and we actually encourage this for parents to read with their children every night for a half an hour. I think that that's critically important that in and of itself will go a long ways for kids not backsliding academically. But even with that, we will be providing extra opportunities for children to come in and get support as they need it. Great. Um, 
So I guess the, the last question here is, um, what is the criteria that SB, SBBSD is looking at in order to return to um, what we would probably consider a normal school year? When the county health department and the state health department uh, relaxes their recommendations on social distancing, on masks, and on, and they'll always track the number of outbreaks within a community, and uh, we will follow their guidance. Now, one of the things that's always interesting is they they will say that it's up to the school district to make that decision finally because the governor has recognized local control. However, they still expect you to hear, adhere to the guidelines for safety. And so until you can do the social distancing and all of the things that come with their recommendations, you, you wouldn't want to bring all the kids back. Um, and we're hoping that, uh, you know, we're hoping that that's sooner than later. But we just, uh, as I said at the, you know, when we were talking a little earlier, it's a, you know, we just can't control this virus in terms of what, if it's going to spike or if it's going to drop off. And, you know, and, and also when there will be a vaccine. So. Great. Well, Donna, is there anything that we maybe did not discuss today that you wanted to talk to parents about? You know. I, the only thing I would like to say, a couple things. First of all, I want to thank our parents and our teachers and our staff. You know, I've, I, it's been an outpouring of support, and I really appreciate that. And while it, there's anxiety and fear for some, and there's, you know, sometimes that uh, turns into anger, I, and I understand that. And so we kind of are just in that space to say, you know, we want you to know that we are – 24 seven looking at every possible way to open our schools and to make them safe. And that we're not making any of these decisions in isolation. We are lockstep with our health departments and we are looking at things from a big picture perspective. And we're also trying to give parents choice, parents who want their children to come back, parents who don't want them physically. We're trying to create as many choices as we can for our parents and our students. And we're also trying to uh, to support our teachers and our staff who are critically important. We want to give them as many choices as we can within our capacity to do that, you know, with pre-existing conditions. And I guess what I would want people to know is uh, the level of concern and care that we have is as high as it can possibly be. We also know that we can't, we, it's, it's not possible to make everybody say that's perfect that's exactly what i wanted and the reason that's not possible is because they don't agree with each other you know sometimes people will say well you should listen to your community well would that be this third of the community or this third of the community or this third of the community because we, we don't want anybody to assume that there's agreement out and amongst the community or amongst the teachers or amongst the administrators. This is one of those things where across the entire United States, there are vastly different opinions. And that's why we have to stay closely connected to the health departments and rely on their expertise as we make these decisions. Um, they're not being made for political reasons. They're not being made for expediency. They're not being made for financial reasons. They're being made for health reasons. And that's physical health and safety and emotional health and safety. And those are the kinds of things that we're looking at. And that's why we are tied so tightly to Boulder County Health, the Colorado Department of Public Health and the experts uh, to guide us. They were in attendance at one of our most recent board meetings. And I would encourage anybody who's interested in hearing what they have to say to go back and log into that board meeting um, because we had their lead a physician in this, you know, Dr. Urbina was there, uh, Jeff Sayach, Heather Craig, uh, all the people from the county health departments that understand the health implications very well. And that's who's guiding us at this point in time. And within that guidance, we're trying to be as family friendly as we can possibly be because we understand um, that we're here to serve our families. 
Well, thank you. You certainly have your work cut out for you this school year, and we thank you very much for your time today. Uh, thank you for all of those who chimed in and uh, tuned in today with the Longmont Leader. We will be posting uh, some Q&A, so we'll go back through this video and and put some easy documentation there for those of you who prefer to read those answers by Dr. Haddad. Um, and if you have any other questions, feel free to reach out to us at info at lamontleader.com. And Dr. Haddad, thank you so much for your time today. We greatly appreciate that. Okay, thank you. I really appreciate the time. Thanks to our parents, thanks to our teachers, our students, everybody. And stay well. You as well. Thank you so much.